It's, it's good to be here. And would you please stand for uh, God's uh, greeting and, and then we greet one another. For those of you who are able, those who find it difficult to stand, that's fine. Um, the psalmist says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. We're standing here in God's house to worship Him. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of His Spirit be with each one of you as we worship together. And uh, please follow in the bulletin that we greet one another. Christ be with you. We have our call to worship here. God makes the sun rise and set. God makes summer and winter come and go. God helps plants grow and flowers bloom. God gives us food to eat, places to live, and people to love us. God is always with us. God keeps his promises to us. He is faithful from generation to generation. So we have an opening prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have. Lord, we've, we've been looking forward to these days for a long time. And we thank you that even though it may be outside now and not in the sanctuary, that we can gather here to, to worship and to praise you. And Father, we just pray that you will accept this worship, you will accept this praise, and that your name will be honored and glorified through this service today. Amen. Our responsive reading comes from Lamentations. I remember my affliction in my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. Yes, this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. You may be seated. The assurance of pardon comes from Psalm 103 where we read, As the Father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we were made, he remembers that we are dust. The steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. And those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments.
just got to make sure I follow this paper. We have our scripture reading, and I'm going to read it out of uh, my own Bible from 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'm going to begin at verse 14 and through it through verse 21. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 through 21. Keep reminding them of these things. This is Paul writing to Timothy, his protege and, and a student pastor, if you will. Keep reminding them of these things. Warn, warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourselves to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter, because those who indulge in, in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenus and Philetus, who have wandered away from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place, and they destroy the faith of some. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription. The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord turns away from wickedness. In a large house there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for noble purpose and some for ignoble. If a man cleanses himself from the latter, he will be an instrument for noble purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do good works. As we gather together, I just want to share with you, I want you to know that, that leadership is not something that is optional. Leadership is very essential. It's an ingredient that's essential for the success of any institution. But I feel that leadership has very fast become an endangered species. I believe that part of the crisis that we have in our country today in America and in American churches today, it's a crisis of leadership. As one man put it, the crisis of leadership is a continuing crisis of character. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, famous Russian author and speaker, in a famous speech that he had at Harvard University a number of years ago, placed his hand on the, uh, on the real issue when, when, when he said, we have placed too much hope in politics and social reforms only to find out that we have been deprived of our most precious possession, our spiritual life. It is trampled by the party mob in the East and by the commercial one in the West. All the celebrated technological advancements of progress, including the conquest of outer space, do not redeem the 20th century moral poverty. We need a spiritual blaze. That's what Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote. An old friend of mine, Dr. Joel Naderhood, who had been the speaker uh, for the Back to God Hour Ministries for many, many years, became a very good friend, and I became actually a member of the board of trustees of, of the Back to God Hour for a while. Joel put it this way once in one of our meetings. We need to set a fire. We need to set a blaze beneath our bosom. And he was talking then about the Christian Reformed Church in particular. I mention this because it forces us to ask the question, what kind of leader does it take to make an impact of permanence and quality in a society where everything nailed down is coming apart? What kind of a leader do we need? And I believe that the Bible reading that we had for this morning gives us a clue. Paul is writing to a young man about to take a place of, of critical leadership uh, within his church. And he writes, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Now it's... it's it's usually considered very impolite to listen to a personal conversation. 
very impolite to be eavesdropping between two people. But this morning, congregation, I invite you to do so. I want to include all of you in this conversation. And even though my thoughts are addressed to Randall in a very special way, I want you to listen to this and to apply it even to your own hearts, to your own minds, to your own lives. Now, each has its privilege. I, I, I don't know how old Pastor Randy is, but uh, I, I think I might have a son or a daughter about your age, so I'm old enough to be your father. And that, of course, has a few privileges with it. So I'm not going to address you as Pastor Randall. I'm not going to address you as an honorable Mr. Reverend Rock. But I'm just going to call you Randy. I hope that's okay with you. Randy, this morning, in a way, through God's word, God is saying to you, do your best. Make it your aim. I think it was Aristotle that said it many, many years ago, like archers, we shall stand a far greater chance of hitting the target if we see it. So I'm going to delineate the target for you. In fact, I'm going to do one more than that. I'm going to give you an exam. It's really a, a perpetual exam. When I try to give myself every time I accepted a call to another congregation during my years of pastorate, one that I try to take every time that I accepted a position as interim pastor after my retirement. It's an exam really that we should all take at one time or another. Actually, it's a good thing if we would take it every day. That's why I invite all of you to listen in to this conversation as well. There are three questions in this exam. Questions that everyone should ask probably every day, every evening. Questions that will help us to evaluate the spiritual quality of our life and for those of us who are in leadership of our leadership. Question number one. Is the Lord well pleased? Is the Lord well pleased? Paul writes, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. For you see, it's, it's possible, it's possible for one to be a great success with men and yet be a total failure with God. It's possible to be so enamored by what others say that we forget what God has said. On three separate occasions, the windows of heaven, and uh, so to speak, were, were opened up, and we hear these remarkable words of, of God the Father speaking to his son Jesus, and he says, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. I ask myself, why is it true? Why, why did God say this? The book of Hebrews gives us an answer in the forms of Jesus Christ. Because it seems like before Jesus left the comforts of heaven, before Christmas, before coming to this planet, Jesus paused on the, on the threshold of heaven, and in Hebrews 10, 7, we have recorded these words of his, Here I am, I have come to do your will, O God. So God found pleasure in Jesus Christ because he did the will of God the Father. Randy, God is calling you not to be flattered, but to be faithful. Not to be a chameleon, but to be a catalyst. Not to be a thermometer, but to be a thermostat. Not one who just registers temperature, but one who determines the temperature within a congregation. Remember, praise is good, but it's like perfume. Nice to smell, but you don't want to swallow it. Let's all remember that God gives the final approval, and it was to that group of saints found in Hebrews chapter 11 
that the author of Hebrews says, without faith it is impossible to please God. May God make you a man of faith, whose ears are tuned to hear one voice, His voice, the voice of the Heavenly Father saying, ultimately, well done, my good and faithful servant. Then we look at that second question. Is it well done? Is the work well done? See, this calls us for a passion of excellence. Not just the ideal of excellence, but, but the pursuit of excellence itself. In art, art circles, there's been a uh, kind of a, a, a running controversy as to who was the greatest artist. Was it Michelangelo, the pupil, or was it Bertoldo, the teacher? The great teacher Bertoldo knew that gifted individuals are prone to just ride along with whatever intellect they had, whatever instinct they had, and rather ride along instead of developing more. It is said that he repeatedly warned Michelangelo, but to no effect. So one morning he walked into the studio and watched Michelangelo as Michelangelo was fooling around with a, a little piece of marble statuary. We told him went over and picked up a sledgehammer and smote, and spoke, uh, smote that little statue into smithereen, into a thousand pieces. In this stunned silence, he then yelled at Michelangelo, Talent is cheap, dedication is costly. In a sense, that's what Paul is saying. A workman does not need to be ashamed. You know, I, I've asked myself hundreds of times, why, why would we be ashamed? I would encourage each one of us to think about that. I wonder if at times we will be ashamed because we aim too low. We're operating without any real standards. We slip into the lowest denominator possible where all is okay with God. We become nothing more than a part of the manageable mediocrity. And I think at times we're ashamed because it costs too little. We not only operate without standards, we slip into the lowest uh, denominator possible in times of service. We serve without sacrifice. One of my favorite, one of my favorite uh, stories out of the Old Testament, out of the life of David really, has to do when, when the people of Israel had suffered from probably that was worse than the coronavirus. A plague had been sent by God to the people and to put it literally, the people were dying like flies. And David goes to the high priest at that day and he asks, what shall I do? And the high priest responds to him, offer up sacrifices to the Lord our God. So David finds himself in the, in the land and the property of a man called Araunah. I'm sure that when Araunah looked out of his house, his heart probably skipped a beat as he sees the king and his entourage approaching. But he goes out to the king and he says, what can I do for you? And David responds, I want to buy a piece of property to offer up sacrifices to the Lord our God. I think you can identify with Arona, who in effect says to David, you've got to be kidding, Lord King. You're the king. I'll give you the property. I'll give you the necessary utensils. I'll give you the sacrifice. I'll, I'll give you everything you need to make that sacrifice. And here David offers a statement that it's a classic amongst human lips. He said, no you won't. Neither will I offer unto God, my Lord, of that which cost me nothing. I won't offer to God that which costs me nothing. Let me assure you, Randy, let me assure all of us that the service that costs is the service that counts. Significant life and leadership is not available at a bargain basement price. It comes at a high priced item. As one man put it, you cannot build a temple, a marble temple, out of a mixture of mud and manure. 
Now there's a third, there's a final question during the exam, and that is this. Is the word well used? This involves a passion for truth. A noble novelist, Ayn Rand, said, Honesty is adherence to truth, and truth is the discover of reality. One of the great challenges that confronts us as Christians is to realize that God has spoken. God hasn't stuttered. He has spoken. God has wanted to communicate with us. And he wrote his message in the book that we call the Bible. That message was written not to satisfy our curiosity, but it was written to change our lives. We did not receive the message so that we could be smarter sinners, but so that we could be Christ-like, so that we could follow the examples and the steps of Jesus Christ. I think that's what Paul added. Do your best to correctly handle the word of truth. To do that, you must know the truth. You cannot teach out of a vacuum. You cannot teach out of that which you do not know or possess. Now hope and pray that in years to come, the quality of teaching, the quality of preaching, the quality of witnessing that comes from this church will be a hallmark of leadership to the entire Ames community. But I think that this passage also calls for living the truth. The church congregation has been and can continue to be a pacemaker of the Christian life here within this community. Now I'm convinced that the three greatest days in a person's life are the day that we're born again, or the day that we're born, and then secondly, the day that we're born again, or that we come to recognize Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, the one who died for our sins, and then third, the day that we come to grips with why we are born again. Why we're born at all. Why we're here. Do you ever ask yourself that question? Why are you here? Not just here in, in worship today, but why are you here? Why are you in Ames? Why did God place you on planet Earth? Why are you in the state of Iowa? I don't think it's luck. I think it's God in His providence has placed each one of us. It's a good thing to ask ourselves every time, who are we and why are we here? So my prayer for you, Randy, my prayer for, for this congregation, for all of you, is that you will have a positive answer to these questions. Is the Lord well pleased? Is the work well done? And is the word well used? May he use you, all of you, with distinction for the bringing up and strengthening of the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Shall we pray together? Eternal God and Father, we thank you for this brief time that we could spend together just looking at your word just wondering what it means to us. You've given us a message here, Lord, a message not only for Randy, but a message for each one of us. We pray that we may take it to heart, that we may live according to your will and do what you have wanted for us to do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I have an elder... First of all, I brought Trisha up here because I wanted to, oh, here we go, get connected again. You gotta be connected to the car also. Okay, I thought so. I'm not gonna put it in your pocket. That's all right, I don't have any money. <laughs> I wanted to bring Trisha up with me, besides holding the microphone in the wind.
So we want to thank you, thank this great congregation for all the support uh, that I've had for about the last six months. Uh, I don't think I would have recovered as easily and as completely as I did without the prayers, calls, emails, text uh, from everybody. Everything from one beautiful card from Dave Shrine uh, Brugger's mother, Shrine Brugger's mother, who lost her husband to cancer, all the way to Janet Baker, who we still get a card every week from, <laughs> with, with pictures of flowers and and, uh, and really cute. But this is, I thought this would be a good time to, to thank everyone for our support. We made it through it. We we'll have a hip replacement coming up, but that's not a big deal. I've had that before. I bounced back from that pretty fast, but I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. And it just shows you that those prayers do reach God and He can be asked to Him. They usually say if two people are together, then God is there too. Well, when this many people were sending messages, I'm sure he said, what in the world is this guy? What about this guy? What's, what's going on? But he, he certainly helped in every phase of the way. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Okay. Let us pray. Father, we, we rejoice in your presence this morning as we look to you for reassurance, strength, and guidance. We, we rejoice that Pastor Rock, his wife Holly, and daughter Rachel have come to Trinity, and we welcome them with open arms, of course, from a safe distance. We also rejoice that Pastor Pot is here today to lead our service, one of my very favorite preachers of all time. We rejoice that we can gather together at church to worship you, even as we must maintain a safe distance from each other. Each of us comes today with concerns, worries, struggles, disappointments, uncertainty, and sadness, but also joys, celebrations, excitement, hope, and more. Now we, want to stay, now we want to step away from the busyness of our lives in order that we may offer you our praise and thankfulness for your many blessings. Hear and ponder your word and take sanctuary in your mercy and grace in the fellowship of each other. We need your reassuring, loving presence here this morning and we thank you for the comfort that only you can provide us. These past months have been difficult for all of us, our nation, and our world. Lord, we pray for patience, humility, truth, wisdom, and righteousness for the people of this country and for our leaders. We pray for all those whose lives have been so tragically affected by COVID-19. We pray for the long-term care residents like Jim Corbin who have been their isolation and loneliness and for their families who are not allowed to visit their loved ones. We pray for the families whose loved ones have had to die alone in hospitals and nursing homes. We pray for the health care workers and many others who must continue working in jobs where they are potentially exposed to the virus. We lift up members of our own church family working in health care. Melody Flangy, Laura Hufford, Nancy Clemmy, and Pam Ross. We pray for their safety and are grateful for their service helping others. We pray for all those involved in working for social justice and participating in constructive conversation and action concerning racial injustice. And we pray for families, for parents to provide loving guidance and stability, and to look at the world through their child's eyes and help them understand what they see and to teach them about God and His amazing love. For children to learn how to interact with others in ways that are kind, to stand up for others who are being mistreated or shamed, and to treat everyone with respect. We pray that people across our nation and around the globe will turn their faces to you, either as a first believer or as a revived believer and work together for good. Please help us be mindful that you are our provider and our protector. And this is our responsibility and privilege to share those blessings and the good news of your love for us. Open our minds and hearts today. 
apply what we have heard in the message and lift our souls through, through, uh, through teaching your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I need the other microphone. You, hear, you can hear me sing if I left this one on. That's right, and that would be good, wouldn't it? Yeah. So would all the people in the cars. No, that wouldn't be good. <laughs> Sorry. Everybody's Thank you. Free for, uh, a good half mile in the area. Right? <laughs> you can sit down for a little while, yeah. Okay, oh, I'm just going to grab that mic. Okay. Try to get out of here. Congregation of Jesus Christ. Today we rejoice in God's love for his church since we have the privilege of installing Reverend Randall Rock to the ministry of the Word and Sacrament in the Trinity Christian Reformed Church of Ames, Iowa. Since he has accepted the call to this congregation, we now proceed with that installation. From the beginning, the New Testament church was called to proclaim the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ to the whole world. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. It soon became apparent that this task was extremely vast and complex. Therefore, the Church, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, instituted distinct ministries to ensure that the work would be done well. Those engaged in this ministry were to function with Christ's power and authority, a power and authority that is rooted in obedience to his word and expressed in loving service. These ministries are therefore to be distinguished from the more general ones given to, by Christ to all of the believers. The office of the minister of the word is one of these distinct ministries. The Bible portrays the minister's duty in various ways. He is a servant both of Christ and of the church. He is a steward in the household of God. He is a teacher to explain the mysteries of the gospel. He is a shepherd who cares for the flock. And he is an ambassador of his king proclaiming the message of reconciliation. The preaching of the word is one of the minister's chief tasks. Such preaching must faithfully reflect the word of God and relate it to the needs of all his listeners. Paul stressed this when he wrote, Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage. And because the sacraments are closely related to the preaching of the word, the minister has the privilege of administering holy baptism and the Lord's Supper. Since the minister has the responsibility to preach the word and to administer the sacraments in public worship, it is his task to conduct the worship service in such a manner that God receives the glory and the congregation is built up and edified. When Jesus said to Peter, feed my lambs, he entrusted the office bearers with special care for the young. The minister must instruct the baptized members of the congregation in the ways of salvation, and he must also encourage and assist those who teach with him. As a pastor, the minister visits the members of the congregation, he calls on the sick and on the suffering, he comforts those who mourn, he admonishes those who stray, he counsels those in need of guidance, he holds and trusts those matters have come confided to him in counsel or confession and he encourages the weak he rejoices with those who rejoice and weeps with those who weep yet the ministers call not only to serve those who already are members of the church of christ but also to engage and promote the work of evangelism as a true disciple of jesus he should show that the church exists also for the world and that the missionary of the church forms an essential part of his calling. As a minister of Christ, the minister must help and encourage the people of God as they care for the hungry, the thirsty, the strangers, the naked, the sick, and those in prison. In all his work, the minister proclaims, explains, and applies Holy Scripture in order to gather in and build up the members of the Church of Jesus Christ. 
For this work, the minister devotes himself to the ministry of prayer, joining all Christians and in confession, intercession, thanksgiving, and praise. Brother Randy, I ask you now to stand and to in, in front of all of the congregation here to witness your response in the strength of the Lord, to accept the responsibilities of this office. And I'm going to ask you. I got to be away from that speaker. I'm going to ask you all of the questions first, and then ask for your response. First of all, Randy, do you believe that in the call of this congregation? God himself calls you to this holy ministry. Do you believe that the Old and New Testament are the Word of God, the only infallible rule of faith and life? Do you subscribe to the doctrinal standards of this church, rejecting all te teachings which contradict it? And fourth, do you promise to be a faithful minister, to conduct yourself in a manner worthy of your calling, and to submit to the government and discipline of the church? Randy, what is your answer? I do. God helping me. God, our Heavenly Father, who has called you to this great and glorious office, enlighten, strengthen, and govern you by His Word and Spirit, that you may serve faithfully and fruitfully in your ministry to the glory of His name and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to stay up here for the life. Members of the congregation, uh, since we're outside, I'm going to ask you to just remain seated and to respond the same way that Randy did, I do, God helping me. But do you, congregation, do you, <coughs> do you, in the name of the Lord, welcome this brother as your minister and pastor? Do you promise to take to heart the word of God as he proclaims it? Do you promise to pray for him and to share with him? in the work of his ministry, to encourage him in the exercise of his task, and to respond to his work with obedience, love, and respect. Congregation, what is your answer? Brother Randy, and fellow Christians, servants of Christ, we all rejoice with you in this day as you begin to work together as a congregation. May you experience much joy in fulfilling your calling as you exercise your authority, brother, the office that's entrusted to you. May you always remain a humble servant. Look faithfully after the entire flock, the old and the young, the faithful and the not so faithful, the healthy and the sick, the strong and the weak. Rejoice with those who rejoice suffer with those who suffer. Use all your talents to the utmost of your ability. Do not neglect your gifts. And one day, our chief shepherd will give you the crown of glory and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And fellow congregation, this is truly the day which the Lord has made. Let's rejoice. Let's be glad in it. Keep your vows. Receive Pastor Randall as a gift of God. Listen to him with all respect due to his office. Encourage him when he needs strength and pray for him daily. And anyone who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And may you and as pastor and as congregation live as a bride longing for the coming of the heavenly bridegroom, praying all times, come Lord Jesus. Come quickly. Let's now give thanks and ask the Lord to help to do what he has promised to do for us. Will you join me in prayer? Thank you, Lord, on this day for your many blessings. Thank you for the church elect from every nation yet one on over all the earth. Thank you for giving your church the task of calling others to your saving grace in Jesus Christ and to the fellowship of the community of believers. Today we thank you in particular for giving the church the special office of the minister of the word. We rejoice that we as a congregation have received a new pastor to work among us. We pray that you will bless him as a servant of Christ in the church, help him to be an inspired ambassador for his king, bringing the message of salvation and reconciliation to all. 
bless him as a preacher and as a teacher, as a pastor, as a counselor, as a friend. May he prove himself a faithful steward in the household of God. Enable us as a congregation to listen gladly and attentively to him, recognizing in his words the voice of the Good Shepherd. Strengthen us in all the work of the ministry so that we may be a salt of the earth and the light of the world. And help us as a congregation and pastor to endure the heat of day and the darkness of the night, sustained by your healing and guiding presence. All this we ask with thankful hearts in the name of your dear Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And now I invite Randy to have his first official act here by giving the blessing. And whatever else. Well, the first thing I would like to do is, is simply to thank God for bringing us together and for bringing us through really the last three months. It's been a journey for you, it's been a journey for me, and just a welcome. I just wrote earlier this week, just thank you for welcoming, welcoming Holly and I so well, and uh, we're really looking forward to this ministry here. It's so good to actually be here and to be able to, to actually get going and working together. Thank you so much for, for coming out today, too. Um, and I'd also like to thank God for just simply making this possible, that we could do this service outside today and giving us a, an option like this to do this. Secondly, Frank, I would like to thank you because uh, you did exactly in that message what it called for, and you handled it well. Thank you for not candy coating it, <laughs> and thank you for um, just being willing to, to share your gifts for so long as well in ministry, but especially here this morning. Thank you. And um, with that, um, I'd ask you to stand to receive God's blessing. As we leave here today, as you go out into wherever God has called you and however people, many people he has put you in contact with and whatever ways are possible these days, know that you do not go into those arenas alone, but may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give to you his peace.